Hello and welcome to the Nonfiction Writers Podcasting in a Great Way. I am Oklahoma State football writer Kyle Fredrickson in the podcast studio on a beautiful Wednesday in Oklahoma City uh, in our downtown newsroom today for a special edition of the podcast, uh, an OSU edition as they face Texas 2.30 p.m. on ESPN on Saturday. Joining me in studio today, uh, the one and only Jason Kersey. Jason, how you doing? I'm doing great, Kyle. I'm uh, gl- glad to be back in the studio with you. The fact that it's your bye week and you're not like on a beach somewhere a beach. or on a couch or just <laughs> doing something non-work related, I appreciate it, man. I just want to let you know hey, from the well, top. I'm, I'm here for you. Gotcha. Well, we'll jump right into it with uh, the Texas game on tap. Like I mentioned, uh, we were lucky enough uh, to get a real source of, of news down there in Austin uh, with Ryan Atulo from the American Statesman joining us by phone right now to preview the game a little bit. Uh, first off, Ryan, thanks for uh, for hopping on the podcast today. And second, uh, what are your thoughts on the game, man? Give us kind of your uh, off, off-the-cuff uh, thoughts about this uh, Cowboys team coming down there. Well, well good to hear from you guys. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, a big game. Whoever can get the win will be setting themselves up well for the Big 12 season. I, I think both of, both of the teams are kind of in that second tier, maybe behind TCU, Baylor, and I, I'll throw Oklahoma up in that top tier for now. Uh, and, and so whoever can get this win, I think, really announces themselves as maybe a spoiler in the Big 12 race. And whoever loses, you know, they, they, they drop a little further. So I, I, it's a nice, tasty week one matchup in the Big 12. Yeah, definitely. And I know for a, a young OSU team with a lot to prove, going down to Austin, uh, in that environment, you know, they got 66 Texas guys on the roster. This is always a, a very big game on the calendar. But, you know, before we get into the, the game talk, um, obviously, uh, with everything that's happened down in Austin over the past few weeks, I'd love to pick your brain and kind of get a reporter's view of, of everything that's happened. Um, you know, starting right off the top with, with uh, Steve Patterson being ousted as athletic director. Uh, I mean, how, how did that play out in your eyes? Was, was, was this a story that for you guys you could really see coming? Uh, did it come as a surprise? I mean, just from a reporter's point of view, how did this thing play out? It just, from our angle, it, it seemed pretty crazy. It, it, it was inevitable. Yeah. He, he was going to get fired. It was just a matter of when, not if. A few days prior to him getting fired, the new president of Texas, Greg Fenves, who's been on the job for about three months, met with the American Statesman editorial board and what was given the chance to support Steve Patterson. And for the second or third time, he declined to do so. <laughs> so, you know, it, the first time it, it kind of raised some eyes, but when when he continually, re, re, repeatedly declined to support his embattled AD, it became obvious that he was going to fire the guy. And it, I think it just became a, a, a situation where how were they going to do it? Who were they going to get to replace him on an interim basis? How much were they going to pay him to go away uh, and to make it as clean as possible? But, um, yeah, I mean, Steve Patterson in 22 months, not a very long time on the job, really upset a lot of people, a lot of key donors. And here at Texas, a lot of people think they're key donors. <laughs> they're right. not. You know, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the people that – give uh you know a couple thousand a year to the university think that they have as much influence as people that give a couple million a year and and you know you you got to make every one of those uh, the, those persons feel warm and welcome and that was not steve patterson's skill set that's not what he did did you ever have any interactions with him did you ever talk with him in in his 22 months there yeah and you know he he was fine he's not the villain that he's been painted um, he, you know, a lot of what you hear is true, though. He he was not not a very warm, friendly, engaging person. Uh, you know, impersonal is is a word that I heard that I, I think is pretty accurate. He he was there to to fix things. He was there to get rid of some dead weight, to cut down on costs. And, and make some money along the way and, and raise the bottom line. And I, I think when all is said and done and the smoke clears, he's going to have done a pretty good job of doing that. <laughs> yeah. But when, when you make those kind of changes, 
you, you really upset people at, at a school like Texas where, you know, the, the, the same faces that were key influential people 20, 30 years ago still are, and they, they don't always like change. And, and I, 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 I won't dig too deeply into this, but I, I covered the University of Michigan uh, d- during some tumultuous times with Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hope right. and, of course, Dave Brandon, the athletic director, and the parallels from there to here are, are very similar. Um, a, a new president comes in at both places and uh, very early on fires the athletic director who the fans couldn't stand because he he, he tried to stir things up maybe a little too much and, and do, was very money driven at, at, at both places steve patterson dave brandon uh, different people but similar approaches and they come from a business background um, so you know it's it, 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 <laughs> i just think it's funny you know my my my, my career is kind of uh Doing a doing a 360 here. Back, so it's your fault. Is, is that what you're yeah, saying? You so, yeah, you, you is, brought this on. It's, it's my fault. Blame me. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, and now Mike Perrin, the interim AD at Texas, you know he he's charged with cleaning up somewhat of a mess here. Is that you know, since you have that unique perspective of have been having been around both of those situations, is that just sort of a you know I've I've heard a lot of people say. Uh, this is just a, a, another sign that people coming from something that, I mean, obviously college sports are, are pretty money-driven, but it's a different sort of money-driven where you had Dave Brandon coming in from uh, Domino's, right? Wasn't he a Domino's guy? Correct, yes. And then, and then you uh, have um, Steve Patterson coming from a more professional sports background when, when it's a more business, private business sort of uh, thought process that it's just you have you can't approach college sports like that even if it is a money-making uh, enterprise is that is that sort of it, the way that you look at this as well that people the, may have to be leery of these sorts of hires in the future it, absolutely there's a very delicate balance uh, college athletics is big business but it's not it cannot be run the same way as professional athletics and steve patterson said something that i thought was really interesting he was asked about uh, Dave Boren's comments about Big 12 expansion. And he said, well, that's not up to me. That's up to the CEOs of the universities. <laughs> he calls the university president CEOs. So that shows you how he thinks. Yeah, and fascinating. Yeah, I think there is a very uh, delicate balance, again, that y- 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 People have been going to Texas football games, Oklahoma football games, Oklahoma State football games for years and years and years. It's the same people. And they're there not because of loud screaming stadium scoreboards and in-house advertisement. They're there for the football. They're there for the band. They're there for the community. And I think athletic directors can lose sight of that a little bit when they're trying to find more money right and I, I i think that's that's a problem i think that's why you're going to see texas either take the interim tag off of mike parent and make him permanent athletic director or they're going to go shopping for an athletic director that is an athletic director now having said that steve patterson was at arizona state briefly before coming to texas but you know he, he is a professional uh, a guy, uh, professional uh you know uh personnel guy and you know that that's how he tried to run texas and it bit him in the end well and especially when when it seems like for texas they went from one extreme to the other i mean when you have the lost dodds who'd been there for for you know 30 years or, or whatever it was um was so good with the boosters sort of understood how to massage that fine line between uh, making money and and keeping everybody happy um, it seems like that that might have just been such an extreme uh, move that, that maybe that caught people off guard. Well, I think so. Uh, you can't pull a complete 180 on fans, and maybe that's what Texas did. I, I think the safe pick would have been Oliver Luck. Yeah, sure. Who was a finalist for the job, who, who was at West Virginia at the time, who is now with the NCAA. And he might be the favorite to come back here. I don't know if he would still be interested. Now he's living in Indianapolis where his son is the quarterback of the Colts. So that, that's got to be very attractive. And, you know, maybe he's 
a little bit scorned that he didn't get the job last time. I don't know, but he is a Texas law graduate, so I, yeah, th- th- there's a lot of appeal there. But, um, yeah, the loss did such a good job of making people feel welcomed and friendly. And, you know, and, you know he operated in a time where it was before social media, before this kind of echo chamber on Twitter. And, you know, Steve Patterson was a victim of that. You get you get some complaints and uh, all of a sudden everybody's complaining and they don't know why they're complaining anymore. They're just right. they're just mad. And, right. you know, a perfect example of that was the, the, the whole deal with the bands, uh, charging charging opposing bands for tickets. Um, basically, it was all to do about nothing. They used to just comp the tickets, and now, they, now they're charging uh, other Big 12 bands to come here. But it, it was an agreement between all the Big 12 schools. Nobody was upset about it, but... It got to a point where everybody just assumed that it was true that Steve Patterson was trying to stick it to another school, another group to get more money, and um, you know that that narrative just took off. But in, in the end, that was that was one thing that he did not deserve to be criticized for. But it didn't matter at that point; his, his reputation was just uh, you know so so sullied that uh, he he couldn't he couldn't escape things that he shouldn't have been in trouble for. Right. That's a really good point. And, you know, switching topics, but staying on the same topic with with personnel changes a little bit. Obviously, another storyline that a lot of just football fans in this state are intrigued by uh, is Jay Norvell taking over the play calling duties. You know, he's a guy uh, who got ousted at Oklahoma for the inefficiencies in recruiting and and the offense and and Bob Stoops wanting to go a different direction, bringing in Lincoln Riley. Uh, And I think, uh, you know, people here were skeptical of that change just based on Norvell's history. But then, heck, he makes a quarterback back change and and it seems like there's a lot of momentum uh with that Longhorns offense how, how do you gauge people's uh belief in in Norvell as a play caller as a guy who can maybe turn things around um you know given that you know his history uh maybe isn't that sterling in in, in terms of leading an offense and and being the type of recruiter um you know that can hold on to a job in the Big 12 being that he was a guy you know who was fired just a just a year ago sure it, it's certainly odd that you know, <laughs> a guy can get fired at one school, go to his rival, and within a game he, he's calling offensive plays. It, it, right. It's not normal. But you know, I, I was thinking of this yesterday at his press conference last night. Sean Watson, the previous play caller who uh, you know has been around the, the Big 12 block for most of his career as well, yeah, I think he got, he, he, he's going to get – uh, blamed for not playing Gerard Hurd, and he lost his play calling duties because he didn't play Gerard Hurd. Jay Norvell could end up getting this job permanently because he did play Gerard Hurd. Yeah, and uh, you know, and I, I don't know how much of a decision that was. If that was a Jay Norvell decision to start Gerard Hurd week two against Rice, or if that was a Charlie Strong coming into the offensive game planning session and saying, "This is who we're starting. We're tired of Tyrone Swoops." Uh, you know, not doing anything with this offense. So I don't know, but so far you got to like what Norvell's done. Um, I, I believe that half of the, roughly half, I, I don't know the exact number of, of the drives that he's coordinated have led to points, be it a field goal or a touchdown. And now is he the biggest reason for that? No, it's Gerard Hurd because he, he, he's making plays with his feet, his arms, his, his head. I mean, he's been terrific, and nobody saw that coming. But uh, I, I, I think Norvell is serious about, one, simplifying this offense. It might have been a little too complex. And, uh, you know, when you have an athlete like Gerard Hurd behind center, you don't need a complex offense. It's, uh, you know, take the snap and run. Right. And sometimes it's that simple. But um, I, I, I think fans here are open-minded about it, and they don't care where he came from as long as he gets this offense going. And the 44 points against Cal is an indication that he has a pretty good plan. So I, I, I think if this continues, Charlie Strong is going to have a really interesting discussion with himself about whether he keeps Jay Norvell as play caller to, to run – the same offense, or if he just blows it up, a la Bob Stoops last year, hires an air raid type uh, guy with air raid, like Lincoln Riley, to 
install his own new offense. I, I don't know, but it's that's a big, big decision that Charlie Strong is going to have to make. The thing that, you know, uh, as someone who covers OU that I found so interesting is Jay, um, you know, uh, the first three years I was on the beat, Jay was a, a great guy. He was great to deal with, and I'm sure you're finding that out too. I mean, he's, he's really, really easy going with the media, or at mm-hmm. least he was here. Um, yeah, he got along with everybody really well. So, so every, you know, you kind of root for a guy like that. I, I felt like Bob had to make the choice he made um, just because the receiver development was so bad. But the, what, what really surprised me about Jay being bumped up to play caller is that he wasn't a play caller at OU. Um, and, you know, he was an offensive coordinator at Nebraska under Bill Callahan, but Bill Callahan called the plays there. And then he was the play caller, I think, one season at UCLA, and I'm pretty sure that whole staff got fired. That was when uh, Carl Durrell was the head coach. That was Carl Durrell in 2007. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. the whole staff got fired. And uh, so it was kind of interesting to me that Charlie Strong would make that move. Um, so a guy can get fired from Oklahoma and then go to Texas and then be promoted above where he was at Oklahoma <laughs> in a matter well, of months. It was kind of fascinating to me. Sure, and, and – I think we were all thinking that this as well when it happened. But if you if you dig deep, Charlie Strong didn't have a, a whole lot of options. So yeah. you, you you strip Sean Watson of his play calling duties. Joe Wickline, who uh, <laughs> we, we could get into. A yeah, we could definitely that. have that conversation. <laughs> but you know, he he was supposedly the co offensive coordinator, co play caller. He may or may not be. A, I guess a a jury will determine that but uh <laughs> so you know he, he the, watson and wickline are, are are gone they're they're relieved of their duties now you got tommy robinson the running backs coach he's just been a career running backs coach i don't think he aspires to be a whole lot more than that he did a he did interview for the troy head coaching job last year that was his alma mater but i don't think he was ever a serious candidate you know he that's who he is he's a running backs coach and then the only other offensive uh, assistant coaches Jeff Trailer, who was uh, 16 years, he was the head coach at Gilmer in East Texas. You, know, you couldn't give it to him because he had only coached one college football game to that point against Notre Dame. So Norvell's really the only option you had left. And uh, Charlie said that part of it was because he, he's familiar with the spread offense. And you know, I I don't know how true that is uh, because again he wasn't calling plays I don't think at UCLA they were doing a ton of spread um, so I don't know it, 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 it's certainly interesting it's yeah. a, it was a desperate move and we'll, we'll see how it goes yeah well it certainly paid out uh, for him through these first couple games and and while we're on the topic we'll, I'll promise we'll move on to actual game stuff but I gotta ask you this this is some, one thing you know I'm writing about the Joe Wickline saga today um, but one question I can't really get answered at this point um, is how the change in athletic director uh, might impact this case because obviously Texas is not named in this lawsuit between OSU and Joe Wickline um, but they certainly play a big part in it, a big role in it. Uh, so you bring in a guy like Mike Perrin, who's much more friendly in, in terms of understanding the needs of an athletic director and, and how a school is viewed. Do you feel like a guy like that might be more willing to step in and say, okay, here's the 600 grand that we need or, or whatever settlement that they can agree to. Do you, do you foresee possibly that change in athletic director uh, maybe spurring this case getting settled outside of court? Because it seems like it's inevitable anyway I would sure think but now so maybe more than ever being that they don't have a guy who's a penny pincher at the top who maybe isn't willing to step in when maybe that's what this case needs to to get some resolution yes I think there's a a very real chance of that now he was asked that at his introductory press conference and didn't really give much of an answer but so going back to Steve Patterson I think one of the big reasons he was criticized um what was for not writing a check and get, getting that over with and, you know, eliminating a, a needless distraction. Uh, you know, he he kind of arrogantly said, well, Texas is not a party to this lawsuit, so we don't have to worry about it, and we're not, we're not going to worry about it. Now, Mike Perrin is a trial lawyer, so the, 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 this is not foreign language to him. I think what you're probably going to see, especially now that, OSU's attorneys would like to depose 
Tyrone swoops the quarterback, right. which Texas just didn't allow that to happen. It, it's not fair to him. I think Mike Perrin is going to shake shake some bushes and come up with $200,000 or something and say, Oklahoma State, is this enough? And they will say yes or no. I guess I would guess that they would say yes, and this will not go to trial. That's what my expectations are. Again, Mike Perrin didn't say that, but I, I think – Everybody wants that at this point. Nobody wants this to linger any longer. It's gone on for over a year, and right, um, you know, it, let's just get it settled. Right, exactly. All right, back to football talk. Gosh, I mean, we could talk these soap opera dramas all day long. Um, but there is a game to be played, 2.30 p.m. in Austin on ESPN. Um, obviously, the the big storyline of text right now is the offense. You bring in Gerard Hurd, a, a guy who's already being compared to Vince Young after just a couple games, and, and it's yet to be seen whether or not this OSU defense can pose a, a bigger threat to the Texas offense than Cal did, uh, you know, having that career day. But I think what I'm more interested in uh, beyond that is this Texas defense. Um, I mean, I would sure think that to this point, this OSU offense with Mason Rudolph and all the weapons that he has uh, is going to be the biggest test. And so far, far uh you know texas clearly isn't a a team that is gonna has relied on defense being that uh you know they rank 118th in the nation with with over 512 yards per game so what is your feeling on the progress of this unit is it you know without some of the young guys and and their their star positions um with a lot of upside is that kind of giving fans hope that they can continue to develop and grow or is this a team that all year long is is maybe going to struggle against some of these high-powered attacks well, the, the hope was that despite losing some really good players to the NFL, uh, four draft picks on defense to the NFL, including first-rounder Malcolm Brown, the, uh, the hope was that because Charlie Strong has been such a good defensive coordinator, you know, maybe the best in the country throughout his career. If you look at his track record, I mean, he, he's up there with anybody. Florida, South Carolina days, I mean, up there with anybody. Uh you thought that he would at least get the guys lined up right and that they would be okay, serviceable, adequate, and, you know, it, early in the season until they really started playing. The, the issue is their defense line is not very good right now, and everybody thought that they were going to be uh, very good. Uh, and they're not getting off blocks. That They're not creating any pressure, and that's making it really difficult on the linebackers who are young, the secondary that's young. They're getting hit with big plays, and you just the absence of playmakers right now on the defense is kind of startling to me. You got Malik Jefferson, the the five star freshman, number one ranked player in the state. Um, he's very good. He can make plays, but he also gets lost. He's a freshman. He right. doesn't always know what he's doing. Uh, the secondary right now, you got uh, some very serious question marks, and Cal really went after uh, one cornerback in particular, John Bonney. So. Uh, it, it, it's it's concerning. I did not expect the defense to be this bad. I didn't expect the offense to play as well as it has the past two weeks. So uh, kind of preseason expectations are thrown out the door at this point. Right. You know, it's uh, obviously it, it probably had to be a pretty incredible game to cover uh, that Cal game uh, with the way that Hurd played and the way that it ended. Um, you know, and, and it's just after the game, I, I'm, I'm of course, you know, and I, all our, our listeners likely know as well. Uh, some of the c- comments from the Texas players were interesting, um, almost in, in some ways pointing to a moral victory um, and a loss against Cal. I mean, it, maybe that showcases just how far the Longhorns have fallen from from their days at top the the college football world but I mean is there something to that just in terms of uh in internal expectations because obviously when, when you're Texas and your players are saying stuff like that you're going to get roasted in the media and, and maybe rightfully so but how much do you think they could actually take from a game like that I mean I when your offense is able to explode with a with a redshirt freshman like it did um I mean that's got to at least give them a little bit of confidence that they can build on uh heading into this game right they can breathe a little bit because they they scored points. They yeah. scored at will. Uh, you know they 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 had a couple turnovers. Uh, other than that, I mean they they just they they did what they wanted. And it's been many many games since since you could claim that. So I all the work they put in, all the talk that hey things are going to be different this year. That they can finally say, look, there there it is. I mean top ten yardage in school history. So. Right. 
Uh, yeah, it, it was a moral win in their mind, and they lost only because of a botched extra point at the yeah. end. Otherwise, they're going into overtime, and you know that they were completely outplaying Cal at that point. The the fans were riled up as loud as they've been in a long time. They were going to win that game in their mind, and, and in my mind too. You know, I think you, you you had to say that the momentum was clearly in their favor. But um, so th- I, I I guess when, when you're Texas and you're not winning many games, and the, you are what you are at this point. You will take good news any way you can get it. And when you drop 44 points uh, after going many weeks with, you know, uh, the the last two games of last year and the first this year, a three-game period, they scored 20 points. Right, yeah. So, uh, you know, they, they, they feel unchained, and, you know, good for them. They, 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 they need some good news. Right. Hey, well, you know, honestly, I, I can draw some parallels between last season uh, with OSU and, and, and this Texas team. You're bringing in a young quarterback uh, who has an impressive, you know, first real game under the lights uh, against a quality opponent. You know, last year being Mason Rudolph on the road against Baylor. They lose that game, but then they take a whole lot of confidence from it and, and going and, and beating OU in Norman, uh, winning the Cactus Bowl and really reviving the season. So I'm sure there's some, some Longhorns fans out there who are hoping for the same type of formula for Sorry, this Texas. Sorry, breaking up there a little bit. Uh, j- j- just comparing the, the 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 Longhorns situation to the Cowboys with Mason Rudolph coming in, being a young quarterback, and and, sure. and I'm sure there's some Longhorns fans hoping for for something similar. So, uh, but hey, Ryan, you know, kind of just one last question here we'll, we'll, before we'll we'll get you off of the the, the cast. Uh, give me kind of your prediction for this game. You know, the Vegas line is I think somewhere between minus four and minus five, and in, in the Cowboys' favor, being on the road playing in Texas. Um, you know, w- what is the feeling that you get from this game? Is is from what you've seen so far? Is a Texas team uh, that maybe that performance has given them enough confidence to stick close with OSU, or or from what you've heard and seen about OSU, does it seem like they're a little bit overmatched? I, th- I think it's going to be another great game, just like we saw last week against Cal. Um, again, going back to my initial comments, whoever can get this win, that's a, that's a big one, and whoever loses, it's uh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I, I think now with two weeks of film people are going to start catching on to Gerard Hurd, yeah. and there will be a game plan to, if not stop him, at, at least slow him down a little bit. I mean, you know, the stuff he did against Cal was ridiculous. Most yards, total yards in, in school history, <laughs> more, more than Vince Young ever had, more than Colt McCoy ever had. So my, my gut right now wants to tell me that Oklahoma State is the better team, but, um, you know, they haven't played anybody. And Texas has played three really good teams. Uh, you know, Notre Dame undefeated. Rice is a bowl team. Uh, past three years went to a bowl. And, you know, Cal-, Cal has some people thinking that they could make some noise in the Pac-12. So uh, it's tough to tell at this point, but my gut just tells me that Oklahoma State's probably a little bit better, but it's going to be a great game. Right. Gotcha. Well, hey, Ryan, uh, thank you so much again for the insight, uh, especially the Patterson stuff. I think all of us Okies are, are real fascinated about what's been going on there and, and looking forward and seeing what happens next. You know, maybe this is a, a Texas team that has made some changes to to kind of turn the program around. So uh, be sure to fi- follow Ryan on Twitter at uh, Atulo AAS uh, with the Austin American Statesman as, as he'll be providing some Texas updates all the way up until kickoff. Uh, but beyond that, we appreciate you listening and uh So certainly, as always, uh, for the best OSU sports coverage around, uh, be sure to check out newsok.com and then read our stories every day in the Oklahoma.